the context was um, uh, back in the late 80s when this happened, it was uh, March, I believe, 1988. Um, back then, they, um, there was a monthly maybe um, evening event uh, where cognitive science uh, people from all over the Boston area converged. On this particular evening, I think there were probably 80 uh, people or something there. Um, and each time uh, there was a paper to be discussed and the authors uh, present the paper um, and then a commentator uh, comments and then there's back and forth after that. And uh, that was the context in which the Rommel Hart and McClelland Pinker and Prince debate got started in that same venue. Uh, the paper was the Rommel Hart McClellan paper presented by um, at least Jay McClelland, I don't know. Um, and then their commentators were Pinker and Prince. Um, so uh, I'm told that uh, the event was fondly referred to uh, as Thursday night at the fights. Um, and it was uh, a lively uh, event typically um, as it was, um, I think you'll see um, when we uh, discussed the Fodor and Pollution paper. Um, that was the paper being presented by the authors and I was the commentator. So I um, <clears throat> was at the University of Colorado uh, in the computer science department at the time. Um, and uh, so um, I will be playing the audio and as uh, you were warned by Paul already, um, it was just a little teeny cassette recorder that my cousin happened to have uh, available to do this recording because he was a student at MIT at the time, has since become a ultimate, an extremely uh, well-known uh, behavioral economist, Matthew Rabin. Um, so the audio quality leaves something to be desired and the question period at the end is particularly difficult to understand. So I think we will not listen to that. Um, but um, the sequence was uh, uh, Zen and Polition first and Jerry Fodor, uh, and then I was to respond. Um, so I don't have, uh, unfortunately, any video uh, visuals for Pelicians uh, and Fodor's talks, but I have my own slides from my talk. Um, Jerry Fodor does make reference to a slide uh, that he showed at the time, but I don't have access to that, so I can't share it with you. You have to imagine it from what he says. Um, um, and um, so, uh, Zen and Pollution um, uh, is one of the uh, well-known founders of the uh, symbolic approach to cognitive science. Um, and so let's hear his presentation of the um, photo and Pollution paper that we've already read for our course. Well, I've been asked to keep it to 20 minutes, and I have never spoken to only 20 minutes. <laughs> Perhaps I should give this talk massively parallel. I understand that speeds things up. <laughs> I'd like to do it in unison. You know? uh, this is a frustrating experience. I've given this talk a number of times, including in Japan, by the way, where people don't, aren't interested in anything else except connectionism these days. Even Pachinko is playing is in second place. Uh, and it's a frustrating experience because the way the talk usually goes is I say, that there have been these interesting insights some 40 years ago from uh, people like uh, like Curie and formalists, and uh, they have led to a, a concept of computing that we know and love, uh, which views computing as being essentially a proof theoretic uh, mechanism. Uh, and then I say that this has uh, become unpopular uh, in a number of circles in cognitive science. Uh, this idea that there are three levels of organization of the system semantic level of syntactic and, of, and of, uh, physical. And then I say that it's unpopular among connectionists for the following reasons. And connectionists think that it's a bad idea, and this is why they think it's a bad idea. And then I go on to say that but they're wrong uh, because we have to have this classical view because if we don't, we are missing certain kinds of things. We don't have, uh, we don't have a rich enough representational capacity. We don't have systematicity of productivity and various other things of that kind. And anyway, all these arguments for massive parallelism and so on are not valid. Uh, 
And at the end of that, somebody, somebody who's a connectionist, and this has happened every time, so I know it's going to happen again tonight. <laughs> somebody who's a connectionist gets up and says, but I agree with all of that. We agree that we need simple systems. We agree that you have to have constituent and semantic structure. So, uh, and, uh, and then the argument gets very fuzzy because it turns out that uh, there is a kind of agreement about the premises, and yet there's this lingering thought that we've been doing it wrong for 40 years, and this new way of doing it is going to produce something that, and we don't quite know what it is. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a better way of going about it, a better way of trying it. Well, if it's not a principle problem, then maybe it's a pragmatic problem. Before I end, I'll say a little bit about what the pragmatics of, of, uh, of this enterprise might be. But let me try to quickly sketch out the way I normally sketch this argument, although doing it very quickly because, uh, because of lack of time. However, you, are, uh, you may have the privilege of reading this in the, the current issue of Cognition, all 60 or 70 pages of it at your leisure. This is the classical view that I said that we all know and love. It's the view that there are certain kinds of systems in this universe, and that, that uh, includes humans and certain kinds of organisms and computers, and God knows what else, that have at least three levels of organization. Not that it's convenient to describe them that way, but re God really made them that way. They're organized at three different levels. So, uh, and, we, and there are generalizations at each of these levels. The reason they have three levels is because they operate on representations that are encoded in terms of expressions or symbol structures. That would, that would be the syntactic level. That the expressions have a meaning, they have a semantics, an interpretation in some domain. And that uh, semantics depends systematically on the semantics of component parts. So the meaning or the, the semantics of an expression is a systematic function of the semantics of parts and the way the parts fit together into that structure. That's a fundamental idea. That's what a, a data structure is. And this, uh, furthermore, for it to be a computer, it's not enough that they have these data structures, but it must also be the case that the system turns over and it works because of the way in which those codes are instantiated physically. So that's the basic idea. And uh, with that comes the, the belief in the tri-level organization, because that, in fact, uh, is, is one way of putting tri-level organization. And the tri-level organization is the fundamental idea behind cognitive science as we know it. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who don't like this. There are people who don't, who don't like the middle part, but like the other two, like, for example, Searle or Dreyfus. There are people who don't like the top part. They like the middle one, like uh, Steve Stitch. Uh, there are people who probably don't like any of that. But then there is, there is a movement uh, that is being fueled by connectionism that says that we can do it all at this level. Now, I know that individual people within that movement may not subscribe to that, but I have to go by two things. One is the manifestos that are part of the, of the public documentation, the two-volume series on PDP. Vol uh, chapter 4 lays out very clearly that the top level and the middle level are, are a mistake. I mean, they're a rough way of talking. They may motivate you, but that when we really get to do this science properly, we're going to do it all in terms of some abstraction over the, the neurological uh, uh, or uh, the mechanism, level of describing the mechanism. I mean, you won't need syntax and we won't need uh, the semantics. Uh, that's one re reason for taking that seriously. And the other one is that if it weren't for that claim, I don't think anybody would have noticed connectionism. I mean, what is really attractive about it is that there is a serious claim about an alternative to a classical view. Uh, uh, an alternative to the view that says that there are systems that represent the world and they work because they represent the world, but they do it without inscribing codes. They do it by having units. If you've got a localist network, then the units represent things like that A is in front of B. Uh, if you're a distributed uh, type, then there are clusters of units. doesn't very much matter for our purposes how it happens, but it's a semantic theory. It's a semantic theory that says you don't need the syntax. You don't need expressions with the combinatorial syntax and semantics. It's popular and it's attractive for a number of reasons, some of them that touch on the very foundations of, of uh, this classical view. Some of them really are quite irrelevant to the view, but somehow are associated with it in, the, in people's minds. So when you talk about people who, who uh, especially in psychology, who say, hey, I'm going to become a connectionist, 
what they usually have in mind as an advantage, other than the fact that they will be part of this fraternity of, of uh, get people, is that uh, there is something wrong with the classical view. For example, it's too slow, because neurons fire too slow, whereas we know that minds work very fast. Uh, you can recognize a picture of a familiar scene in a few hundred milliseconds, whereas it takes a neuron several milliseconds to fire. So in the time that it takes you to do a very complicated thing, you can only get a, a few uh, hundred neurons firing. But surely that's irrelevant, just as the rest of the items on this list would be irrelevant, because that has to do with how you realize the architecture. I mean, when you think about it, uh, a conventional computer like a VAX, from this point of view, is massively parallel because every time you do a, a fetch into memory, you actually disturb almost every element in that memory, about half of the elements. So there's actually activity taking place all over the place. So uh, the classical view is not touched by this argument. It has something to do with how you might realize a Turing machine in, in various kinds of uh, physical components. And the sensitivity of classical architectures to noise and physical damage is cited routinely. But that, too, is irrelevant. It's true that if you smash a vax with a hammer, it won't just work a little stupider. It won't work at all. But that's not true if you uh, implement the same architecture in a slightly di different way. For example, if, if the random access memory is, is implemented in, a, in an optical manner, uh, in a holographic memory, then it really will deteriorate gradually in quality. So those are surely criticisms that only have to do with particular implementations or even particular models. These other things over here have to do with particular models that you see around. It's true that some production systems don't uh, uh, have any notion of degree of probability of firing a rule, but some others do. Yet these are routinely cited as advantages to, for the connectionist approach. And finally, the, uh, the claim is, is made quite explicitly in PDP that it's hard to see how a classical architecture would be implemented in brain tissue. Well, I mean, it's very hard to see how a classical architecture would be implemented in silicon, too. But it turns out that it is. And moreover, there's no reason to anticipate that the, the way in which you implement it will have any of the structural properties of the system you're trying to implement. I mean, there, there's nothing about the implementation of the Lisp machine that is Lisp-like. There aren't any parentheses in it. And you'd be very surprised, in fact, <laughs> if, uh, if there was a relationship between levels of organization of systems that was this transparent. You would be very surprised if the implementation of geological laws of erosion and volcanoes and so on actually had little rivers in it and little bursting volcanoes. One never expects that kind of relationship among levels. So. The fact that, that uh, your theory of, uh, uh, of the cognitive process, the theory of how representations are processed, uh, that, that theory doesn't look like the way it's going to be implemented in brain tissue, surely cuts no, no way. It's not either for or against uh, the classical architecture. OK, now let me give you a few, in a few remaining moments, let me give you a some of the reasons that we've laid out in our paper that Jerry and I wrote together for why we think a classical architecture is uh, not only undamaged by these kinds of arguments, but in fact there is something rather special about the kind of architecture where the system writes strings of symbols, writes expressions. I shouldn't say strings. They don't have to be strings. That's, that's one dimensional. They, they could be any arbitrary expression, but they have to have this this compositional property that the semantics of the expression is a function of the semantics of parts. Here is a, uh, well, the, the, I think the simplest and most straightforward argument is the one that seems to impress people least. But let me tell you what it is. So, and then I'll, I'll go on to another version of it. The simplest version of it is productivity. That is, we've got the capacity to represent things. And that capacity is not bounded. It doesn't mean that we can have an infinite number of representations. It means that we can represent new things in a way that's structurally related to how we represent things that we actually do have represented currently. So I can think new thoughts, and the, things, the new thoughts that I think are structurally related to thoughts that I already have, just like in language. You can generate a new sentence, and it's structurally related not by a slot and filler method, it's structurally related in a way that involves a, a recursive 
componential analysis, a re an analysis of the whole in terms of its component parts. Now, that kind of productivity, uh, it seems to me, argues very strongly against a view that doesn't have that doesn't separate a generative mechanism from some place where expressions are written. But because it talks about unboundedness, uh, a lot of people are unimpressed by that. So there is a version of this uh, which doesn't talk about unboundedness, but is the same is exactly the same issue. It goes like this. Uh, if I have the capacity to represent that it's dark outside, oh, sorry, let, let me start off with a complex one. Supposing I can represent that it's dark and cold outside, I can have that thought, just like I can have that sentence. Then it would be a very special case indeed if I were incapable, in principle, of representing the thought, of having the thought that it's dark outside, or having the thought that it's cold outside. In general, my cognitive capacity and that of any other intelligent organism is such that if it's capable of representing some complex P and Q, then it's also capable of representing parts of that complex. Now, there are exceptions to that. There are exceptions in natural language, and there are exceptions in probably in mentalese. So that I can, for example, I was in Japan a couple of uh, uh, months ago, and I can say, uh, Eki wa doko deska, and I think that means where is the uh, subway station, and I can say sushi, but I can't say where is the sushi, because I don't know the compositional properties. I know that expression as a, a, a point in, in my space of representations. Now, connectionist networks allow you to do that. They allow you to represent P and Q. They allow you to represent it's cold and dark without forcing you to also have the capacity in that architecture of representing the P or the Q without representing that it's cold or without being able to have the thought that it's dark. Now, of course, you can impose on yourself the discipline if you're designing these networks. You can pose, impose on yourself the discipline of every time you do represent some, some, some semantically complex field, then you require that you have some node or some subset of nodes that will represent the constituent part of that, a part of that semantic field. But the architecture doesn't force it. And in classical systems, the architecture forces it. And that's very important because if you, for if you impose it externally when you're designing a particular model, then part of the theory of the capacity of that system lies in the head of the person who's putting together that particular one. It's an empirical degree of freedom. And there are a lot of degrees of freedom in these networks. I mean, some of them run into hundreds or thousands, and they can interconnect in uh, n times n minus 1 possible connections. There are a lot of degrees of freedom. So the being able to do it is one thing, but being forced to have that capacity is another thing. And only classical systems, only ones in which the semantics is mirrored by complex, uh, well, I give you an example already, so I won't read that one. Only systems in which you have to write down these expressions force that. Now, there are, um, there are closely related uh, systematicities and capacities, like the ability to form, to do certain kinds of inferences. So if I can infer from P and Q and R that P, <coughs> then invariably I can also infer from P and Q that P. And the reason for that is, in classical systems, there are rule schemas. There are variables to be bound. And in those kinds of schemas, the way that you do the complicated inference is exactly the same way as you do the simpler ones. So that systematicity comes out as well. Uh, I had a few other comments, but I think that I'm going to uh, make sure that Paul gets a chance to uh, tell you how he agrees with all of this. So I'll uh, move on. Let Jerry talk. Well, the, the, the rumors. Okay. Well, the, the, the rumor seems to have gotten around that I think um, connectionism um, is the lousiest new idea in cognitive science. Um, this rumor is entirely unfounded, and I proposed it to uh, uh, the Scotch this evening. In the first place, I don't think connectionism is a lousy idea. What I think it is is two lousy ideas. One about uh, <laughs> one about uh, one about mental processes, and one about learning. And in the second uh, 
place, I don't think it's new. On the contrary, it seems to me to be uh, uh, the reiteration, I mean, if you forget about the computer chat, um, the reiteration almost without elaboration uh, of, a, of, a, of a doctrine that I'm going to call primitive associationism, uh, and I mean primitive in both uh, respects, um, which certainly goes back uh, without alteration to Hume, uh, and which probably goes back to Aristotle, and which every American and, and, and as far as I can tell, British behavioral scientist, almost without exception, believes in his genes. I mean, the way that lemmings believe in throwing themselves into the ocean, uh, uh, American behavioral scientists believe in primitive associationism. And this is just another regression to this doctrine, and will pass. Um, that's roughly the outline of what I'm going to say. I'll, let me just fill in a couple of details. Um, um, first, the idea about mental processes. The idea about mental processes is that the succession of mental states in the course of a mental process, I'll talk about thoughts instead of mental states, but I mean, I'm using the term totally generally. The, uh, the succession of mental states or thoughts uh, in the course of a mental process is determined by habitual connections among them. Thus, if the idea of B is evoked by the idea of A in a certain mental process, that's because the organism has a certain mental habit, namely the habit of associating the second idea with the first. The organism's mental habits, in turn, reflect historical regularities in the organism's experience. And the psychology of the organism is simply the network of historically conditioned habitual connections among its thoughts, reading again thoughts broadly for intentional states at large. This story about mental processes um, has uh, and has had over the millennia two kinds of problems that it has never managed to get over. The first is that if mental processes are constituted uh, of habitual associations, it's hard to account for novelty, productivity, systematicity, and stuff like that in thought. That's what uh, Zen and I said uh, for seven or 800 pages in this article and, and what he's uh, 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 briefly uh, summarized. The second is that it's hard to account on this kind of view for the coherence of thought. In particular, since the probability that one thought will cause another is determined entirely by historical factors on this kind of view, it's hard to reconstruct the intuition that the contents of thoughts are somehow responsible for their causal connections. What I take it that Turing did, and what earned him his sainthood, uh, was show us how we can connect thoughts in virtue of their contents by assuming that they're syntactically structured objects. That's the basic idea of computation. Whereas on the view that the only kind of determinant of relations of causation and succession among thoughts is historical, it turns out to be just a sort of historical accident that one regularly reasons from P and Q to P and not, say, from P and Q to not R. Um, so that's the first idea uh, um, uh, that defines primitive associationism, the notion that thinking is basically a habitual process. Uh, the second uh, idea is uh, an idea about learning. It's the idea that what learning does is it alters associative relations among mental states. It alters the weights of the connections among such states, as we now say, so that the statistical relations among thoughts come to be a sort of analog model of the co-occurrence relations among things that they're thoughts of. Look, I'm very proud of myself. I made a slide. This is a <laughs> four-color homemade slide, uh, which I do by hand. Uh, and I propose to show it to you. So, uh, so here's the picture. At the level of the mind, you have causal relations among thoughts, which I'm picking up in that usual way, namely by their intentional contents. So the thought, so thoughts of A, say, cause thoughts of B, uh, uh, um, in virtue of uh, some associated relation among them, uh, and with a certain probability, which one can call X. Um, in the world, one has the things that these thoughts are thoughts of, A's in the case of thoughts of A, and B's in the case of thoughts of B. And these things cause one another with a certain, or co-occur with a certain probability, which we can call Y. Thoughts are connected to the world in the obvious way, namely by some semantical or referential relation, or something of that kind, which everybody sort of takes for granted because nobody knows what to say about it. Uh, okay, the function of learning is, on this kind of picture, is simply to make x as close to y as possible. It's to get the correlation among thoughts to mirror the correlation among the things 
that their thoughts of. In effect, X is the organism's estimate uh, at asymptote. X is the organism's estimate of the reliability of the correlation Y. That's the picture of learning. Um, now I'm going to turn this off. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Philosophers don't get to have slides very often. Um, okay. Um, on this view, in a nutshell, the idea is that learning is a form of statistical inference. That's the primitive association, associationist view of, uh, of learning. And the idea that thought is, is, uh, is the exercise of habitual relations among intentional states, coupled with the idea that learning is a matter of statistical inference, is the intellectual content of this doctrine. Um, it's a doctrine of which, as far as I can see, the connection is picture is simply the reiteration. And it's a doctrine um, which has, I think, the property, the following sort of uh, 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 negative charm, that, that the cogn that's what's called the cognitive revolution uh, consisted almost in its entirety of providing alternatives for these two postulates of primitive association. That is, of providing a picture of the mind such that we can account, such that we can hope to account, so at least sort of global facts about the mind, and which doesn't assume either that mental processes are exercises and habits, uh, or that uh, learning is a process of uh, uh, statistical uh, inference. The idea, according to this revised picture, is that the causal relation uh, among thoughts is a function not of habitual connections, but of the structural and, in particular, logico-syntactic relations among mental representations. What was wrong with associationism on this view is that it lacked the notion of the logical syntax of thought. This is essentially the point that Zen's just been making and that we uh, went on and on and on and on, on about uh, in our article. Um, um, in the, as far as the second idea is concerned, the cognitive revolution, uh, so-called, uh, consisted largely in the insight that, in the interesting cases, Learning isn't statistical inference, it's theory formation. What the organism does in learning is to construct a mental model not of the stochastic relations among objects in its distal environment, but rather of the underlying roughly causal mechanisms that account for those relations. So it was the replacement of a, of a, of a, a, a theory construction, there, it was the replacement of a theory construction uh, model of learning for an inductivist model of learning, much as in the philosophy of science, we've seen the replacement of a theory construction model of scientific uh, 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 progress uh, for, a, uh, we've seen such a, a model uh, replace an inductivist uh, uh, model. Um, well, the rest of what I want to do this evening, since we've talked at such great length about, about, the, about what it costs you to give up on the notion of the logical syntax of thought, uh, the rest of what I thought I'd do this evening uh, is to, is just to remind you of the sorts of considerations that led cognitive theorists 30 or 40 years ago to prefer the theory construction model to the statistical model of learning. I'm going to draw my examples uh, from an aspect of language learning, though I think the relevant considerations are probably entirely general. It's just that language has been one of the better researched intellectual domains, so we have some idea of what has to be learned to learn to do the damn thing. Um, um, None of what I'm going to say to, uh, to you will be uh, any news to you, especially if any of you are phonologists. I'm just uh, to uh, use Wittgenstein's expression, exam uh, assembling reminders. I take it that if any of you have ever taken a sort of ph kindergarten uh, level phonology uh, 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 course, everything I'm about to say will be old hat. Uh, OK, so now <coughs> um, um, suppose that you've somehow gotten it into your head in the course of trying to explore what learning's like to build a model of a certain human capacity, namely the ability to pronounce a phonetic sequence corresponding to an arbitrary but pronounceable orthographic sequence, sequence of letters in, say, English. Formally, this is a function from expressions uh, uh, under orthographic description, you know, so you spell them out, they're typed out or something, to expressions under phonetic descriptions. You could then plug this whole business into a chip to get it to actually pronounce phonetic sequences, in which case you would have, for example, a reading machine for the blind. Okay. Now, the reason I picked this example is that there actually is an up-and-running connectionist model uh, which uh, attempts to do this. Uh, and, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, it makes all the mistakes that I'm now about to enumerate, and is thus uh, interesting as an example of its kind. Uh, now, what makes the project of trying to build a reading machine like this something that goes from a 
an orthographic uh, phonetic representation, uh, uh, sort of interesting, is that the mapping of orthographic onto phonetic elements is fairly many, many, uh, and appears to be contextually determined. And one of the things that's said about about uh, connectionist devices, three things are said about connectionist devices. They take the brain seriously, they take uh, learning seriously, and they're very hot stuff when they have to deal with context. Um, the interesting, the reason this is an interesting case, one of the reasons this is an interesting case to look at from the point of view of evaluating such theories is that in a reasonably uh, rigorous sense, uh, this function of orthographic on the phonetic elements is uh, contextually determined. For example, uh, the orth orthographic element that's printed S is pronounced S when it occurs at the end of the words cat or pack, uh, but it's pronounced Z when it occurs at the end of the word dog or fat. So there's some interaction between the way the damn thing is specified between the phonetic shape that this uh, orthographic element has and the character of its context. Now, these differences in the grapheme-phoneme correspondence are actually quite regular. And one way you could solve your problem is by just wiring the appropriate generalizations into the model. Text readers uh, made on that principle have, in fact, been up and running since the Second World War, uh, plus or minus a decade or so. But another way to approach the problem would be to try to get the model, this computer that you're trying to build, to learn the grapheme-phoneme correspondence by a process of statistical inference. Thus, we might provide the device with a lot of examples of orthographic sequences paired with their correct phonetic counterparts. In effect, we'd provide it with a big data matrix, and then we'd allow the device to estimate the correlations that this matrix exhibits. Uh, namely, the correlation between the orthographic environment of a grapheme and the phonetic value of that grapheme. Here's to a first approximation what the device would find if we ran it on such a data matrix for English. The regularity is that words that end in B, D, and G have uh, uh, S's that are pronounced uh, Z, and words that end in P, T, and K uh, have S's that are pronounced S. The story is actually a bit more complicated than that, but it's that kind of story. Uh, moreover, the same cluster of elements, this, these same clusters of elements, turn up in other statistical regularities exhib exhibited by the data matrix uh, for the grapheme phoneme correspondence. For example, vowels lengthen after B, D, and G, but not after P, T, and K, and so forth. So there are, as it were, correlations among the correlations. Uh, and the consequence of that is that if we did a sort of factor analysis on the data matrix, we could extract familiar phonetic features, like in the present case, plus or minus voiced. Well, what we've just described is a connectionist solution, is the standing connectionist solution uh, to the grapheme-phoneme correspondence problem, except that in connectionist networks, the whole problem is analogical uh, in the sense that instead of having explicitly represented hypotheses about grapheme-phoneme correspondences, what we have is weighted connections between representations of graphemes and representations of phonemes or phonemes or whatever. Uh, and instead of contributing to a data matrix over which statistical calculations are performed, observations of particular grapheme-phoneme pairings are registered as alterations in the weights of these connections. So it's statistical inference run by an analog machine. Um, 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 and in fact, in general, I mean, this is a special case of a perfectly general fact, considered as learning devices, connectionist networks, indeed all um, primitive associationist models, are uh, mechanisms, in this case analog mechanisms, for estimating statistical correlations. And now, finally, we come to the point. Um, I mean, aside from wanting to sell it to the DOD or something, there is no point uh, in, uh, in wasting the effort of building this model. The reason there's no point is that it's quite clear that you can't learn the grapheme-phoneme correspondence for English by a process of <coughs> estimating statistical correlations between the orthographic environment of a grapheme and its phonetic form. This is because the orthographic environment of a grapheme does not determine its phonetic form. In, co in consequence, your machine can compute correlations between orthographic environment and phonetic forms until it's blue in the face, and you will never get the output to sound right. The problem is that the phonetic expression of a graph, what you may do if you carefully or by accident don't look at any of the counterexamples, is account for 98.674% of the variance. That's of no interest if the counterexamples are principal, and the counterexamples are principal. The problem, um, um, uh, the problem, as I say, is that, uh, is that uh, the uh, phonetic expression of a graphy depends not only on its orthographic environment, 
but also on its syntactic environment. Correspondingly, the, ortho the uh, ontogenetic problem, um, uh, if you're trying to build a theory of how human beings learn uh, to do this, is to understand how you, uh, the, orthograph the ontogenetic problem in understanding how humans learn the grapheme phoneme correspondence is to figure out how they work out this complex dependency between orthographic environment, syntactic form, and phonetic expressions. The examples of the impl impact of the influence of, of syntax, abstract structure in general, in this area are very pervasive. Uh, the stress system, for example, the thing that distinguishes black birdhouse from black birdhouse is redolent of, saturated with, uh, uh, with the effects of syntax. Prosodic, for example, the distribution of prosodic pauses correlates with syntactic junctures. And in fact, there's nice, very old experimental evidence that shows that hearers know this and, uh, and do not treat syntactically conditioned prosodic pauses as hesitations, though, though non-prosodic pauses of the same length that are just sort of randomly distributed uh, in the speech stream are, 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 are heard as stutters or hesitations or whatever. Um, um, uh, even at the level of morphology, that is, of the pronunciation of individual lexical sequences, uh, the effects of underlying uh, abstract structure uh, are, um, are very striking. Let me give you an example, uh, which I wish I thought of, but was in fact being uh, peddled around here by Morris Halley, I think 30 years ago. Um, this is the, um, this is the uh, case uh, of the Swingle Singers. Uh, the Swingle Singers, uh, this isn't going to be turned musicological. I, I'm, I'm interested in their name, not their performance. Uh, the, thing, the interesting thing about the Swingle Singers from a morphological point of view is that the G in Swingle is pronounced hard, and the G in Singer is pronounced soft, right? I mean, I don't speak this dialect very well, and I have a tin ear, which is why I did philosophy rather than phonology. Um, but I'm told it goes Swingle Singers, Swingle singers, okay, is that <laughs> about right? Okay. Um, 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 why is the uh, is there the difference in the way these words, are, th these sounds are pronounced, given that their orthographic environments are identical? Answer: uh, It turns out that um, that the rule is that you're pronounced soft if you're a noun, if you're a G in a noun in the appropriate place, derived from a verb, and if you're not derived from a verb, you're pronounced hard. So you get finger and finger and linger, which aren't uh, uh, verb derived, but ringer and singer, which are verb derived, and you get the soft G. Notice that you don't have to look at the connectionist machine to know that it won't get this right. The reason it won't get this right is that the relevant parameters, the parameters over which you have to do your analysis, simply aren't represented where this machine is able to look, namely in the orthographic environment. Of the uh, uh, of the phone in question, what you have to look at is its linguistic history, something that doesn't present itself on the surface, and that involves roughly your knowledge of the general structure of the language. This principle is, by the way, productive, as I will give an example to show for anybody who wants it at the end. The final note, just on the example, is that um, that the reason that extant text readers don't work, the reason that people who have been building text readers since the Second World War haven't built text readers that they're, uh, uh, that, uh, that they're happy with is not that they're realized on conventional computers instead of uh, macaroni. The reason that they don't work is that they're precisely unable to cope with things like, like, pro uh, like uh, prosody uh, and stress and these other areas where the orthographic environment uh, doesn't determine phonetic form. The phonetic form is determined by relations roughly to abstract features of the language. Um, that is, the problem that's solved uh, in the, in the, by the connectionist machines that do this is the problem that's been solved for 30 years, I and mean, that's a trivial problem, to get the statistics of the relation between orthographic environment and phonetic form right. The problem that isn't solved, the problem that nobody knows how to deal with, uh, is the problem of the interaction between orthographic environment and syntax, and that's the problem on which the, uh, the uh, connectionist models have provided no illumination. Well, <coughs> what's the moral of all this? You might think something like this. You might think, after all, it's just that we were estimating the wrong correlations. Instead of trying to compute the statistical correlation between the orthographic environment of a grapheme and its phonetic form, 
we should have been trying to compute the statistical correlation between the orthographic and syntactic environment of a graphene and its phonetic form. And in a sense, this is the moral. Any learning problem, indeed any problem of non-demonstrative inference, can be thought of as a problem in statistical inference by thinking of it in this sort of way. However, if you do think of it in this way, you need to divide the problem of understanding learning into two parts. There's the hard part, which consists of understanding how the organism figures out what hypotheses to try, what hypotheses to, what hypotheses to try to compute the level of statistical confirmation of. And then there's the easy part, which consists of figuring out how the organism actually does the statistics, given the relevant space of hypotheses and the relevant bodies of data. The progress of cognitive science up to connectionism, but not including it, consisted in coming to understand that the problem of learning does have these two parts, and that it's the hard part that's hard. It's the hard part that we don't understand. Viewed this way, connectionism contributes solely to the easy part of the problem. Instead of doing our statistics with a digital statistical package, we can now do our statistics with an analog statistical package, if we're so inclined, or rather, more precisely, given the actual state of the art, with an analog statistical package simulated on a digital computer. <laughs> as far as the hard part of the problem of learning is concerned, however, the connectionist contribution consists exhaustively of not having noticed it. The result of not having noticed it is that if you make these points to a connectionist, at least in my experience, he will say this. Well, that's all right. All we need to do to complete the solution of the grapheme phoneme learning problem is to add to the front end of a connectionist network, sorry, to add to the front end of the system we built, a connectionist network that somehow learns the syntax. This is correct. All you need to do to solve the problem is to solve the part of the problem that nobody can figure out how to solve. Solving the part of the problem that everybody already knew how to solve does not count as contributing to solving the problem. I am moved to tell you a joke uh, in conclusion that Hillary Putnam told me when I was a graduate student uh, and that changed my life. Um, uh, this is a joke about a physicist who's walking down a street, uh, not just sort of minding his own business, thinking about particles or whatever he's thinking about, um, and another physicist runs up in a state of great glee, throws his arm around him and says, uh, I've done it, I've done it, I've built a perpetual motion machine. No, no, the first is no, no, second law of thermodynamics, blah, blah, can't be done, got mathematics, but never mind, I've done it, I've actually built the thing, come to the laboratory, I'll show you. So he drags him off to the laboratory, throws open the door of the lab, and there's this enormous collection of apparatus, and lasers, and spacers, all the stuff physicists have, blinking lights everywhere you look. And the physicist says, gee, you know, um, this really is, this really is very impressive. Uh, I don't think I've seen such a, a massive collection of ga gadgets for many years. Um, however, I notice, um, that nothing's moving, uh, to which the other physicist looks a bit crestfallen and he says, I know, I know. It's almost done. All I got to do is to add a device that goes like that forever. <laughs> <laughs>
and the relationship between connectionism and classical theory, uh, in particular, what they have to say about implementation, I want to uh, resoundingly reject. The first thing I want to comment on is the overall argument structure in the crux of the paper. It looks pretty much like this. Um, and this, this argument structure is found in other critiques of connectionism. First, propose a simplistic representation and process, hopelessly simplistic, in fact. Second, claim it's what connectionism advocates. Third, point out the inadequacies of the proposal. That's really easy because of one. And four, claim that any significant improvement in the proposal turns it into a classical account or an implementation of one. Okay, that's a very good formula. And it's been used quite effectively by several people. But uh, what I want to basically argue is that it's really a trivialization of the issue. Uh, if you have the impression, as I do reading the paper, that it shouldn't really be this easy, that's the reason. It isn't that easy. Um, the connection is proposals that are discussed are impoverished because they oversimplify the true commitments of connectionism. They, uh, in particular in this paper, uh, it's only insofar as connectionism can be seen as a rerun of earlier proposals that connectionism can be seen as all, at all. In particular, although they acknowledge it in the abstract that connectionists think this issue is important, they do not think that distributed representations bear on their argument, and that'll be the main point of my contribution today, to show that distributed representations change everything. Um, the characterization of the classical approach uh, in, in this paper and in others is uh, so bloated that there's almost nothing it can't embrace, and that poses a lot of problems too, especially when you combine that with the notion of implementation that has been uh, blown up to cover any, anything that I would want to call a refinement on the classical view. Okay, so that's basically um, where I'm coming from. I want to make a general claim about the in-principle philosophical arguments of the kind found in this paper. I think the negative in-principle arguments on this issue are quite inconclusive. I think that's as true of the anti-classical arguments as it is true of the anti-connectionist art uh, arguments. The, the positive in-principle arguments uh, that one can make, I think, are possibly valuable in showing how to conceive previously inconceivable accounts and can be viewed as proposals for future research. So th it was in this spirit that my paper for behavioral and brain sciences was written that will be coming out shortly that tries to give a positive uh, in principle argument for uh, connectionism. It was not intended as a negative in principle argument against the classical view. Uh, this issue of positive versus negative in principle argument bears quite strongly on section four in their paper, which then it uh, summarized in his presentation. Uh, the section goes basically like this, present several arguments for connectionism, and then without telling anybody, switch to viewing them as arguments against the classical architecture, and then show how these negative arguments uh, don't hold water. I think it's interesting to note the shift from an offensive to a defensive posture here, whereas arguments almost uh, invariably used to go, well, the problem with connectionism is it can't do X. Now, more and more you hear that, well, the classical approach can do X too. And I think that in and of itself is quite interesting. Okay, uh, in order to lay out my, my view of what the basic commitment of the connectionist approach ought to be, in contrast to the one adopted in the paper, let me... Um, put up uh, the two formalisms, classical and connectionism, which uh, I think drive all the other considerations. We all know that in the classical formalism, formalism, mental representations are formally modeled as elements of a symbol system and mental processes as symbol manipulation processes. In the connectionist formalism that I've advocated, the ment mental representations are viewed as aspects of the state of a dynamical system. In this case, it's a network system. The state of the system is a vector in a high-dimensional space. If we have n nodes, it's an n-dimensional space, a continuously varying state space, usually. 
uh, which consists of a lot of vectors giving different combinations of activities for all of the units in the network. S uh, similarly, mental processes can be formally modeled as the evolution of that dynamical system, the kind of differential equations that govern how the state moves around in the state space in time. Okay, now what I want to bring out by putting these up side by side is that these formalisms reside on opposite sides of a big divide in mathematics between, on the one hand, discrete mathematics and on the other, continuous mathematics or analysis. And my commitment, in fact, is to learning what this entire half of mathematics has to teach us about computation and cognition. What I'm committed to is learning what is there to be found, and I'm convinced there's lots to be found. Okay, uh, an overall perspective on choosing a connectionist form, the connectionist formalism over the symbolic one. What we're doing in the process is taking out a huge loan, and I would be the first to admit we've barely begun to repay that loan. We're still paying almost uh, entirely interest. We're still trying to solve the problems we've created for ourselves instead of trying to solve the problems of cognition. And in my view, we stand in the development of our understanding of connectionist computation about uh, in Aristotle's position in understanding symbolic computation. So there's not much we can do until we get from Aristotle to Turing, and that's a long way to go. I think that this loan has been taken out for a worthy project, and that the rate of progress is encouraging, even if the size of the debt is awesome. That's my assessment of where we stand and where we're going. Now, what are the implications of this particular view of what connectionism is about for uh, the methodology of actually carrying out uh, connectionist research? Well, I think it's worthwhile imagining the space of all connectionist dynamical systems that we could be looking at and asking which ones should we look at. Well, on the one hand, there are these very simple associ associationist kinds of models that um, Zen and, and uh, Jerry talked about in their paper. On the other hand, there are uh, systems like the description of the VAX computer at its lowest level, which are dynamical systems that are literally implementations of symbolic accounts. And the force of, of their critique, and others like them, is that these are light years apart. Now, I don't know about you, but what that says to me is that there's lots of room in between. In fact, uh, a lot of the uh, critique of connectionist uh, work in, in their paper and elsewhere, I think, falls prey to what I call the extremist fallacy, that there are only two coherent views of connectionism, this one and this one, and that arguments against this are therefore arguments in favor of this, and vice versa for that matter. Now, if you want to carry out the extremist fallacy, it's very good strategy to bloat this until it fills almost the whole rest of the space. If you be very promiscuous about what is accepted as a symbolic account, and very sloppy about what's accepted as implementation, you can fill up an awful lot of room at calling everything implementations of symbolic accounts. The point about that is that there is a usage of implementation that we inherit from computer science, and we ought to use it. If you have an account of a computational system at one level, an account at a lower level, then the lower one is an implementation of the higher one, if and only if. The higher description is an exact, precise, algorithmic account of the behavior of that system. Not if it's some sort of rough summary, not if it has some of the same ideas, but if it's an exact, precise, algorithmic account of the behavior of the system at the higher level of description. Unless you adopt that con concept of implementation, then the con ultimate conclusion of their paper can't hold, which is that as long as connectionists are doing implementation, they're not going to change the cognitive architecture. It's only under that reading of implementation that that conclusion is licensed. If, you're, if you take a very broad definition of implementation, then that conclusion no longer follows. So what I advocate as a methodology can be expressed uh, in this picture. <coughs>
Okay, there are several different kinds of computational systems involved in this picture. At the top level, we have computational abstractions that um, include, for example, memory constituent structure, the abstraction argued for strongly in this paper, attention, and so on. These are basic atheoretic ideas about how computation and cognition get performed, especially in, in the mind. Now, these ideas take a particular formal shape in the symbolic paradigm. So memory becomes location addressed memory. Constituent structure becomes trees, and so on. And the implementational approach is, having done that, to find how we can implement, in a very literal sense, in a connectionist network, those things that make this symbolic instantiation work. So you talk about Im connectionist implementation of pointers, uh, connectionist implementation of car and cutter. Okay, that's the implementational approach. And the alternative is to ask, for these computational abstractions, what are the natural and powerful connectionist instantiations of those ideas? Okay, to go directly from the abstraction of memory to the kinds of content addressed pattern memory you find in connectionist systems, not to go through von Neumann notions of memory at all. And when you're done, you get a set of, uh, of mathematical representations of these computational ideas that's intrinsically situated in a connectionist formalism. The relationship between what you've got and the symbolic account is not the relation of implementation. That's the relation between these two. What you've got, as long as both are descriptions of the same kind of cognitive system, what you've got is something like this. These higher level descriptions are approximate higher level descriptions of those, not exact algorithmic descriptions of those. Okay, and um, as many of you uh, who have heard me talk or read about this stuff before, we're probably tired of hearing, I'll say that just as uh, Zenon and Jerry offer a heuristic for assessing questions about levels of description by asking, well, is this property true of the description of a vax at the level at which it's really physically instantiated? I have a different heuristic for assessing the validity of statements about levels. Mine is to ask, is it true of the way quantum mechanics relates to classical mechanics? And there you see this picture very, very clearly, that spanning the classical and the quantum theories, there are certain basic principles of physics, such as those relating to position, momentum, energy conservation, and so on. They have one particular formal shape in the classical theory and a different formal shape in the quantum theory. And the quantum theory is not a literal implementation of the classical theory, but just the same, they have a lot to do with each other. Largely because they both instantiate at root the same kinds of principles, and because they are both veridical descriptions of the same system, namely the physical universe, at different levels of abstraction, at, of uh, analysis. Okay, so that, uh, those are my comments on what implementation really means, and what it means to adopt an implementational uh, view of how connectionist models should be developed. Okay, um, the, the main topic I want to talk about is how um, the, the, the notion of constituent structure that is argued for strongly in this paper can be and has in fact already been incorporated into connectionist models and how the critique fails to apply to models that uh, use distributed representations. And in order to do that, uh, I have to talk about two levels of description in connectionist systems that have distributed representations. At the lower level, we have uh, the description of the system in terms of the activity of individual units. And it is at that level that the algorithms defining the computation are, are defined. They talk about how individual units affect each other's activity. Then at the higher level, we describe the system in terms of um, the activity vector giving the state of the system. And it is at that level that semantic interpretation is done in distributed systems. 
So it's patterns of activity and not individual units that have semantics in distributed systems. And that's the key point that makes them different from the kinds of systems discussed in the paper. Uh, in fact, as I will show you now with, a, with an extended example, the semantic interpretation involves uh, taking the initial, the, the vector that represents the entire state of the system and resolving it into components, seeing the vector as a sum of several constituent vectors, and I mean constituent in the same sense that they do, several constituent vectors, and therefore seeing that the semantics of the whole is related to the semantics of the parts. And what I'm talking about now is the relation between the total vector describing the system state and other patterns of activity which add up to it. I'm not talking about the relation between the pattern of activity and the individual activities of units that comprise it, okay? And I'm not making the mistake I'm accused of making on page 21, section 2.1.4, <laughs> of viewing the constituency relation as a between-level relation instead of a within-level re relation. When they told me two years ago it was a within-level relation, I believed them and I understood it. So that's not the mistake, if there is a mistake. And the... Um, Okay, so the picture here that uh, we'll talk more about is that this, uh, the state of the system which has as its semantic interpretation the representation of a cup with coffee, I'm going to show you how to view as the sum of a vector representing a cup and a vector representing a coffee. Okay, so in the strongest case of this two-level segregation in connectionist models, what we have is at the higher level, we have um, semantic interpretation possible, but no exact intractable algorithm. That is to say, the algorithm is specified in terms of individual units, and except in very special cases, there's no tractable description of how the system evolves strictly in terms of when one vector will go into another vector. At the level of semantic interpretation, typically there's not both an exact and closed form analytic, analyzable, algorithm that could serve the basis of explanations for the behavior of the system. At the lower level, on the other hand, we have just the reverse. In the strongest case, the individual units in the network have no semantic interpretation, so there's no um, tractable and exact way of talking about semantics at that level. Of course, in principle, they may have some representation, uh, some representational significance. Uh, you can always def define a unit to represent all states of affairs on which it's on, but that's a useless definition, and in general that's all you can expect. The semantics then is not accessible at the lower level, but the algorithms defining the processing are. So what this means is that the, the real difference, and what this debate is really about, I think, is that the classical account assumes that the level of semantics and the level of algorithms are the same, that the semantics and the processes are both defined in terms of the same items, namely the symbols in the symbol system. Whereas in this account that I've called the proper treatment of connectionism to distinguish it from lots of other views of connectionism, in this view, in systems using distributed representations, the level at which semantic representation is done is higher than the level at which the processing algorithms can be specified and understood. Okay, so in terms of cognitive architecture, uh, as it was defined in the paper, what's that in the classical account, there is a, a cognitive architecture that simultaneously at a single level has exact and tractable semantics and processing algorithms, whereas in the PTC view, the cognitive architecture is split between a level for doing semantics and a level for describing the processing algorithms. That's the difference. Now, before I go into the story about how the constituent structure uh, of connection of systems using distributed representations can be understood in terms of a uh, vector for the whole and, its ve and the vectors for its parts. Let me just say a few words about this whole idea of using vector decomposition to explain the behavior of dynamical systems. It's a very common technique um, and it works uh, best for, uh, for linear systems. 
uh, in which the story, so this is the, the best version of the story, and it gets complicated from there, is this. You want to know, if I give the system an input vector, a whole bunch of activity values, let it chunk away for a while, what will its output be? What behavior will be induced by that input? Well, it turns out that for linear systems, the following is the general picture. First you say, how can I decompose this vector? View it as a sum of a bunch of constituent vectors. Uh, so in this case, the vectors are these E's and their coefficients that tell how strongly represented in this particular input each of these E's are. These E's are called modes of the system. Then, knowing that, having decomposed the input in terms of, of its vector uh, constituents, it is then possible to write down a closed form expression for the state of the system at any time. It's just the sum of the states arising from each of the modes independently, and those modes are determined specifically so that you can write down how they evolve in time. They typically, if you've got a physical system that oscillates, then you get this kind of thing, that the a particular mode produces an oscillation with a particular frequency. And knowing what each mode does, knowing how each input is represented as a uh, bunch of input of modes superimposed, you can then describe what happens to the, uh, to the arbitrary input you started with. And the vectors that you break the input into, these modes, are determined by the particular dynamics of this system. So if we change how the system interacts with itself in time, we'll change the way we break I up in order to understand the, input, the output. There's no unique way to decompose a vector. That is to say, there are lots of ways that this input vector could be viewed as composed of constituents, but this is one that happens to provide a good explanation for what happens when that input hits the system. There may be other decompositions that are also explanatorily relevant. Uh, if you want to see any example of this in an actual connectionist network, this technique can be used to understand the categorization that goes on in uh, Jim Anderson's brain state and box model. Okay, so focusing in then, how does this notion of vector decomposition relate to the central claim, uh, the central technical claim in the Schroeder and Collision paper about connectionist models, which is that their representations are all atomic. They have no constituent structure. Well, uh, for the kinds of networks in which the pic the, this picture, figure two in their paper, for the kinds of networks in which this can be viewed as a literal description of the units in the system and their connections, which I would call hyperlocal representations. Not only are all the elements, basic elements, represented by individual units, but the composites constructed from them are also represented by individual units, such as this A and B unit. In such hyperlocal representations, uh, systems, then their critique is, is completely valid. However, for distributed representation, it is not. In the case when what's doing the representation are patterns or vectors instead of units, then the story uh, falls apart. So the way I propose to, to, to get that image across is to follow a suggestion that, that Zenon made uh, in a debate with Hinton and Rommelhart at the Cognitive Science meeting in 1984. What Zenon proposed was that <coughs> the connectionist representation of coffee can be extracted as follows. You take the connectionist representation of a cup with coffee, and you subtract off the connectionist representation of a cup without coffee, and what's left is the connectionist representation of coffee. Right? That's not constituent structure, right? It's okay, it's, it's not the, the full constituent structure, which I'll get to later. It's a simpler idea of compositionality. The um, the notion here is that we have this distributed representation, and in order to make it uh, more uh, intuitively uh, transparent, instead of using an arbitrary encoding with no semantics at the level of individual units, I've used uh, micro features that are of a particular hokey form. Um, you can see what they are here. This description of a cup with coffee has a brown liquid with flat top surface and a porcelain curved surface and a burnt odor in it. 
And what we do is we subtract off the representation of cup without coffee. And what I've taken away here is the representation of the upright container and the porcelain curved service and the finger-sized handle. And what's left from the original representation of cup with coffee is now the connectedness representation of cup without coffee. <coughs> okay, now what does looking at things this way buy us? I think it buys us something valuable. It tells us that the representation of cup with coffee can be viewed, or having blackout here, the representation of the cup with coffee as a vector can be viewed as the representation of the cup plus the representation of the coffee. However, there are a lot of caveats to be added to that. First of all, the, um, the relation is really uh, between a vector that represents cup in a certain context and a ve representation of coffee in a certain context, namely the coffee of the context of being in the cup. Those two get added together. And furthermore, there are certain components, such as uh, round liquid contacting porcelain, which probably more properly belong to a representation of the interaction between the cup and the coffee, rather than to the cup or the coffee alone. And if we look specifically at the representation of coffee, which all of this was supposed to give us, then what we see is that this description is of a brown liquid with flat top surface, curved bottom and side surfaces. This is a representation of coffee, but a representation of coffee in the context of cup with. We would get a very different representation of coffee. Uh, some features in common, but many different. If we started the construction with a can of coffee and subtracted off the can, we would get a cylindrical shaped pile of crystals as our representation of coffee. That's extracted from a different cup, a uh, different context. Okay, so um, if we perform this process, we get a bunch of vectors that can be said to represent coffee in different contexts. If you wanted to talk about the representation of coffee, you would have to abstract over those contexts somehow and talk about a bunch of vectors and something like a family resemblance relation that knits them together. So let me give the moral of this story. Okay. Unlike with hyperlocal representations, with distributed representations, complex representations are composed out of the representation of the constituents, and that this is in fact a within level relation between one pattern and other patterns that superimpose to form it. The constituency relationship is important for the analysis of these models in explaining their kinds of high-level regularities operating in their behavior. But this constituency relation is not important for the actual processing mechanism. And that means that the fact that the decomposition in the constituents is not unique and precise is not a problem for the processing mechanism. It doesn't have to do a decomposition before it can process it. The analytic technique, therefore, is an approximate technique for semantic analysis rather than an exact one. Okay, so the overall conclusion could be stated that distributed models do instantiate a constituency requirement, a weak one, and we'll talk about a stronger one in a minute, but they do not implement a symbolic language of thought in the strong sense of implement that I argued for earlier. Okay, so now specifically in their paper, uh, because we've had these conversations over the years, I guess, in part, um, specifically there is a, cl a claim that the analysis in the paper applies whether or not the nodes in that three uh, node diagram I showed refer to single units as in a local representation or a group of units as you find in a distributed representation. The claim is also made that the links in that diagram represent causal connection only. They represent something like activity flowing from one to another. And the and it's just not possible for both to be true in the distributed case. If what these nodes represent in the distributed case are a pattern representing cup with coffee, a pattern representing coffee, and a pattern representing cup, which is what they claim their nodes represent in the distributed case, then the relation that these arcs indicate is that this is a vector constituent of that, and so is this. 
It's not a causal relation at all. It doesn't mean that activity here flows and causes activity here. It's a structural relationship, exactly as you have in the language of thought. <coughs> OK. Um, so that was a discussion of how distributed representations give rise to constituent structure in a very weak sense, that is to say, the sense in which cup and coffee are constituents of cup with coffee. Now, of course, that's not strong enough to get all the kinds of productivity and compositionality that are argued for in this paper. And it was worrying about that fact that led me to the next uh, piece of work I want to talk about, which is extending this approach to deal with real constituent structure of the kind you find in compositional languages. Okay. So let me go back to that view that there's a big space of connectionist models. And on one side, there are those connectionist systems that are implementations of the symbolic language of thought. And on the other side, there are very simple associationistic models, such as figure two in their paper. On the far left, we have no constituency at all. What I've talked about now is a little bit closer to the right side here. The simple distributed models, such as the cup with coffee, show that there is a simple notion of constituency. It's not one that shows how to take role independent constituents, such as John, Mary, and loves, and throw them together to make John loves Mary. And that's the next step here. So uh, the next topic, and last before I summarize, is this, that uh, there's a class of representations that I've been studying, which I call tensor product representations. And it's a broad class. It's a general method for representing structure that uh, has par parametric variation that l allows it to cover very simple cases, such as this, up to representations that are starting to be uh, what you might want to call an implementation of the true language of thought. The, this class of representations allow fu fully distributed and full sense of constituency where role independent constituents are assigned to roles in a structure and the resulting representation of the structure emerges from the representation of the parts. Okay, so I really am literally thinking about the following problem here. How can complex data structures of this type be mapped onto patterns of activity in such a way as to make the constituent structure available. Okay. The, the first step is to give a general framework for this, proce this problem of representing symbolic structures. And I do that in the following very simple way. There's a set of discrete structures li like trees of that form, and a vector space, the space of states of a connectionist network. And we're talking about a mapping that shows how to represent a given structure as a vector. And the way this family of representations is constructed is as follows. There's two steps, A and B. The first thing you have to do is to give a decompositional process of the structures themselves. The first thing you say is, OK, these structures are built out of role-independent fillers. So I have a set of fillers and a set of roles. And every structure is a set of bindings of fillers to roles. So for every structure, such as that tree, there's a set of bindings telling you for each role that's bound what the filler is bound to it. That's the first step. It doesn't really have to do with connectionism at all. The second step is to give a connectionist representation of the fillers and of the roles. That is to say, for every filler to assign a vector in some representational space uh, network representing fillers, similarly, to assign to every role a vector representing the roles. And then as to use the same superpositional idea of adding the constituents up to get the representation of the whole that we saw for the cup with coffee. The representation of the entire structure is a literal sum over all the bindings of the representation of the filler, that's a vector, of activity values times the representation of the role. And what I mean by times here is a certain kind of vector product called the outer product, or more properly, the tensor product. And here's a picture of it. It's a very simple idea. It's not um, really very complicated at all. Here's the pattern of activity representing the role, uh, different activity levels, using different gray levels here. 
here's the vector representing the filler, and inside you see the vector representing the binding of this filler to that roll. Each unit here has an activity which is the product of the two units uh, in its row and column. Okay. Um, so this is a particular way of solving a, a problem that has really been uh, nagging the connectionist representational uh, world for a long time, the so-called variable binding problem of how to take a pattern representing a variable and a pattern representing a value and give a, a connectionist representation of their binding that has the right computational properties. And you can analyze this way of doing it and see that it does. It's really a generalization of techniques that have been used to solve this problem in particular instances in the past. Okay, so now let's go back to, to Zen and, and Jerry's critique and see what this particular representational structure can do for us in terms of the kind of inference problems they're worried about. <coughs> okay, using this class of representations, it is possible to define a family of representations uh, of tree structures. So we can view P and Q as a tree with N at the top, T at the left, Q at the right um, child. The representation of that structure can be given as a vector of the sort I just described. And it turns out if you compute it, it has the following property. It's a function B of the representation of P and the representation of Q, where B is a particular process of taking a vector for um, that represents the and at the root of this tree, the vectors representing the P and the Q, and operating on each with a particular linear operator, which is the kind of thing you expect to emerge in these kinds of vector analyses. Okay, now. What's the significance of that fact? Well, if you look in footnote 9, page 14 of uh, this paper, you'll see that this is exactly the definition of a physical instantiation mapping of combinatorial structure. Now, actually, it's not a physical instantiation. I'm not physicalist about these vectors. They're just vectors. But the same idea presumably applies that this does represent uh, a instantiation of combinatorial structure of the, the power that um, we need to really grapple with these structures effectively. Now the next question is obviously, well, you've just given an implementation for a symbolic language of thought. I'm sure that you've all suspected that ever since this slide right here, the kind of thing that connectionists are never supposed to put in overhead projectors, right? You've just been waiting for the implementation to come along. And here it is, that my implementation, but I claim it is not an implementation of a symbolic language of thought in general, that depending on which family member in this family of representations, there's a lot of free parameters I haven't committed myself to in order to make this analysis work. Depending on how you do that, there's, uh, which amounts to properties of these operators here, you can fail to have any of the following properties hold. First of all, uniqueness with respect to roles or fillers. Uh, if you don't do psi right, even though this all this formalism goes through, P and Q will have the same representation as Q and P if you don't do it right. Or P and Q will have the same representation as P and R if you don't do it right. Okay. So depending on how you set it up, you may lose uniqueness uh, with respect to the roles or the fillers. Uh, you may lose unbounded depth. That is to say, you may get you may have P and Q, P and Q and R, just fine. But eventually, uh, when you've di got deep enough, you may no longer be able to stick more uh, information in the structure that formula still holds. Uh, you may fail to have non-confusability in memory. If you take a connectionist memory, take the pattern for P and Q, put it in there, take a representation for Q and R, put it in there, you may get confused. You may not be able to recall one of them without confusion from the other. This does not sound like an implementation of a language of to me. I don't know about you. You may fail to have associative independence. You may be able to take P and Q and associate that pattern with something, and Q and R and associate that with another one, but not be able to associate P and R with what you want to, because the constraints among these relations won't allow it. So you can fail that to have that too. OK. Now here's exactly the, the punch where somebody's going to say, oh, well, um, so 
once we have a vector that represents the entire tree, we can feed it into a massively parallel process now. Okay, we don't have to chunk around taking cars and putters and cars and putters to get the information. It's all there. It's all in accessible in parallel. Now, it's all well and good to say, as they say in their paper, that the classical view has no commitment to serial processing. We like parallel computation, too. Well, fine. Give me a massively parallel symbolic model that analyzes tree structures, and I'll be happy to compare it to this. But I don't see it out there. Okay, so that's one thing we get from going this route. Another thing, of course, we get, as usual, is content addressed memory for these structures. We uh, expect that they will now take part in this system in statistical inference of outputs from inputs, in statistical learning from experience. All those things we just heard are so bad anyway. So I don't think they really want to call this an implementation of the language of thought. But maybe we'll find out in a few minutes that I'm wrong. Okay. So five, uh -huh. the parametric variation in this class of representations of those trees extends from simple hyperlocal representations of the sort they dismiss, that's a special case of this, towards, uh, and I won't say all the way up to, but getting quite close to a true implementation of the symbolic language of thought. And if you want that, these are, this is the limit you have to go to. You have to drive this representational system, the parameters in it. <coughs> in the following way. You have to take the dimension of the space of representing these things to infinity. Otherwise, you can't simultaneously represent infinite depth structures and not have not get too much confusion. You've got to take the angle between the vectors representing different roles to 90 degrees so you don't get interference in memories. And the same thing for fillers. And if you want, if you happen to want uh, a symbolic, uh, a, a sequential, an implementation of a sequential algorithm, then in your processing mechanism, what you do with this representation is you insist that the vector equivalent of car and cutter and cons, these primitive symbolic operations, are all that can be done in one time step. You don't avail yourself of the massively parallel options that otherwise would be available to you. Uh, finally, I've talked so far about representations, but not about processing. If you're interested in this inference as, as they are, from P and Q to P, it turns out that in this class of representations, that can be achieved by a linear transformation <coughs> on these vectors, the kind of transformation natural for this category of representations. So you can achieve that in a connection as representation too. Those people who tell me that you can't do um, structure-sensitive operations, tell me how come we can do this and still don't have an implementation of language of thought. Okay. So, again, the option is always open to say everything that remotely resembles trees and so on is a, is a implementation, in which case I say fine. Okay, final. My conclusions are these. That connectionism needs to worry about combinatorial representations and processes. And that's a lesson that I learned from these people and i um, grateful for that. Uh, the hyperlocal models cannot handle this. Agreed. One more reason why they're bad, as I've always thought. Um, however, even simple distributed models can handle compositionality without implementing a symbolic language of thought. That was the coffee story. A simple kind of compositionality agreed. But it's already con uh, contradicts the content of the paper. The, the fourth claim is that this particular kind of representation that I've been talking about can handle complex com combinatorial structures that are truly built from role-independent constituents. But at the same time, these systems do not, in general, implement a symbolic language of thought. But there is a limit in which they approach such an implementation. More general conclusions. The classical connectionist dispute is less over what computational abstractions need to be instantiated. We're not fighting over whether there's compositional structure, or we shouldn't be. We should both accept that. The issue is, what kind of formalism, what kind of computational formalism are we going to use to instantiate these abstractions? Are we going to use dynamical systems as the connectionist formalism advocates, or are we going to use symbol systems as the classical one advocates? So the job of connectionist research is to discover how these computational abstractions can be embodied naturally and powerfully in dynamical systems, not how you can 
the, the instantiations we already have in symbol systems. Constituency can be instantiated. In particular, the, the kinds of uh, abstractions we now, I think, understand how to implement or uh, instantiate. I don't mind implementing abstractions. I just mind implementing some odd language and thought. Um, the, the constituency notion can be instantiated by vector decomposition, as I've already talked about with both coffee and this uh, more elaborate representational scheme. And the problem of binding variables to values and of representing complex structures can be naturally handled within this um, dynamical system scheme uh, using this tensor product operation. So the relation between the classical and connectionist accounts is this. The classical accounts are approximate higher level accounts of the connectionist systems, where the degree of approximation goes to zero in certain parametric limits. Limits. Remind you of something from another uh, level story. The final claim then is that the connection, according to the connectionist view, the cognitive architecture is two level. It's higher. There's a higher level for semantic interpretation, a lower level for processing algorithms, and there's no precise formal way to collapse them in the way that the classical architecture requires. So that's my commentary. I'm ready for all the condescension that you can muster. <laughs> it's <Before> coming. <laughs> <laughs> Before we do, though, we'll take a short break. Uh,